Jeff, and you better straighten your picture. Oh, yeah. <laughs> picture is straight. The angle of the camera is off. <laughs> Dancing fear lab. the goal of knowledge or was it removed, put in the back of the book and then replaced with a new preface in 1918 geared more toward connecting the philosophy of freedom with antiposophy. The problem with that is that the original chapter one presents the key to understanding the book. So if you miss that, you're going to miss the key to understanding the book. Knowing how it relates to antiposophy is going to really help you that much in, in working through the book. So this original chapter one is critical. The goal of knowledge is inner truth. And that's really what the philosophy of freedom is about. It's recognizing the difference between inner truth and outer truth. So it's a really important uh, chapter. When I finally discovered it and started studying it, I mean, it was just amazing. The whole book just opened up. I don't mean just a general book. I mean, every paragraph of the book opened up. I mean, you can kind of sense there's a comparative study going on because he always gives an example of one thing and then follows it up with another thing and compares the two. You can carry that into the book and it really opens up a real science of freedom. Last week, we were into discussing individual life. And now this week, when we move on, we're into uh, individual truth. Individual life is it's an expression of the depths of human nature. I mean, some examples of that, the individual was interested in individual validation versus expert validation. He was interested in individual empowerment. Uh, the individual is interested in finding his own way rather than following a hero. He was interested in individual ideals versus group ideals. Uh, interested in being yourself rather than being what's normal, conforming to being normal. Uh, the individual is coming out of their own, the depths of their own nature is interested in individual action versus collective action. It's interested in individual initiative versus being part of group initiative. Uh, and it's interested in individual expression rather than following the rules and norms to express yourself. I mean, that's kind of a re review from last week. So the individual life comes out of the depths of human nature. And now we go take that over to individual truth, which also comes out of the depths of human nature. He kind of started where Gerda left off and continued further. But anyways, this video gets into that. And then we could uh, discuss it. Our age wants to draw forth truth only from the depths of the human being. Of Schiller's two well-known paths, our present age prefers the second. We both seek truth, you in outer life, I within, in the heart. And thus each is sure to find it. In the eye, if the eye is healthy, it meets the creator without. If the heart is healthy, it surely mirrors the world within. That's right. This is Schiller is a deep friend of Goethe, and uh, Friedrich Schiller uh, observed how Goethe was operating. So Schiller watched him, and Schiller noticed that, of course, that they were very opposite. They were very opposite in their tendencies. So this is what Schiller is actually addressing to Goethe. This is actually something that he's written to Goethe as a kind of letter. Yeah. That. What we see with, with Schiller and with Goethe, Schiller says, um, we both seek truth, you in outer life, I within, in the heart, and thus each is sure to find it. If the eye is healthy, it meets the creator without. If the heart is healthy, it surely, surely mirrors the world within. So what Schiller is actually saying to Goethe is this, you, I seek truth within the heart, but you seek truth through what you're perceiving. Yeah. You see truth in outer life. If you look at a picture, if you look at, a, at a, a painting, a portrait of Goethe, his eyes are huge. 
This is a man whose senses are completely open to the world, and he loves the world. And he, he observes the world with his full soul. So one begins to feel that Schiller notices that Goethe looks for truth through his senses by observing the world. Therefore, he finds truth in outer life. Schiller, on the other hand, we find, is a person who retreats into his library, he retreats into his study, he reads histories, and he, and he tries to, he lives more in his imagination, but he lives really kind of away from the sense world. He lives a bit in his ivory tower. So, so Schiller has noticed that Goethe seeks truth through the senses, and he notices that he himself, Schiller, is seeking truth reflected in his heart. And so he's saying, both of us are sure to find truth, but you're going to find it in the outer world, I'm going to find it within, within my heart. Now Steiner has said, of Schiller's two well-known paths, our present age prefers the second path. The second path is the path uh, through the heart. It's Schiller's path that we actually abide by today, more than Goethe's path. So why does Steiner have all those books on Goethean science and on you know, all that whole series, but he doesn't have a book on Schillerian science? I look back at The Science of Knowing, which was uh, you know, a book that preceded the philosophy of freedom, where Steiner discussed Goethe and Schiller. And in there, he talks about that all of Goethe's creative work was based on a philosophy and a worldview. And Goethe just kind of had a sense of it, but he wasn't, his mind didn't operate in a way that he could articulate it so that others could understand what his worldview was. In the table of contents under preliminary questions, the science of Goethe according to the method of Schiller. Schiller was a friend of Goethe's. They were good friends, they communicated a lot with each other. And Schiller, had more of a, a philosopher's mind. Schiller studied Goethe's mind. So this is significant as far as how it relates to the philosophy of freedom. The philosophy of freedom is more about uh, understanding how the mind works, understanding how we originate worldviews, understanding the cognitive processes within the mind. So in that sense, the philosophy of freedom goes in the direction of understanding the mind rather than just observing. So it's an inner path of a study of the cognitive processes. And that's the approach taken by the philosophy of freedom. We're interested in that inner study of the mind rather than the outer study of nature. As far as the book being a uh, study of the inner processes of knowledge, you can see it in the first half of the book in the structure as a study of the mind, the first three chapters relate to the personality of willing, feeling, and thinking, going up to thinking in chapter three. And then the, the final four chapters are about cognitive processes, perception, conception, creating representations of reality in chapter six, and then a study of cognitive processes as a whole in uh, chapter seven. Within the book, there's a comparative study going on between outer truth and inner truth. It always begins with an outer truth and then adds the inner truth to get the full reality. It is a second path that will today be found most useful. Goethe's path and Schiller's path, it's Schiller's path that is most useful today. I just take that in the context of this chapter where he's talking about um, the, you know, the, the impulse of today is that inner impulse. You know, people want their, to find their own inner truth and they don't want an outer authority to dictate to them what that is. And, and that, that's the sense I, I took that statement in. Now, why is that valued? I mean, that goes down to the next line and that's conviction. Truth that comes to us from outside always bears the stamp of uncertainty. We are only convinced by what appears to each of us inwardly as truth. You know, you hear something in the news, you know, you read something and question it, especially if you're scientifically minded, you're kind of skeptical of what you hear. 
so you you really don't have much conviction in, in what you hear from outside but if something appears within us as truth we have a realization that ah yes i understand this i get this i've confirmed this we know it to be true well then that's then we have conviction if you look at life conviction is really critical to be able to act to do much of anything you really need conviction only truth can give us confidence in developing our individual powers Whoever is tormented by doubts find his powers weakened. If baffled by a world full of riddles, he can find no goal for his creative activity. So conviction gives us confidence in our activity. We can find no goal for our creative activity if we're filled with doubts. We no longer want to believe, we want to know. Belief demands the acceptance of truths that we do not wholly understand. What is not clearly understood goes against our individuality that wants to experience everything in the depths of its inner core. The only knowing that satisfies us is the kind that submits to no external norm, but springs from the inner life of the personality. Here we're comparing inner knowing with belief. We no longer want to believe, we want to know, which is very much of our scientific age. It's interesting how he says, what is not clearly understood goes against our individuality. I mean, it's not ours unless we understand it and we make it our own. That falls in the category of individuality when you make it your own. Belief demands the acceptance of truths that we do not wholly understand. So if you can't make it your own, then it becomes a belief, which doesn't satisfy us as individuals. A knowing that springs from the inner life of the personality. It springs. Whenever I facilitate a group, I don't sit down and prepare an outline before I go into the room. I just have a specific topic and I go in and I wing it. But I feel like I'm really lucky because everything we've talked about is true for me. It's amazing how things come either to me directly or come to me through someone else in the group. And we always seem to have these very meaningful meetings, whatever the topic. And it feels like that it's coming from this deeper place. But it, it's because, I mean, I have made certain things my own. I share usually from my personal experience, but it seems to always come from a place that elevates the people that are were in the discussion and then it touches something in them where they have an experience and then they make a contribution it's a creative process that i share with other people well, i get i get the impression that when you walk in there into the room if you haven't uh, prepared a lot of notes or anything uh that would indicate to me that you have confidence I don't get the sense that you're walking in there filled with doubt as far as, oh, Correct. what am I going to say? Right. You it must, just flows, yeah. You must walk in with confidence. So you have to say, well, where does this confidence come from that I can just walk in a, in a group cold and I'm confident that everything's going to work out fine? You know your process. You know how you're going to approach it. Right. It's, it's going to spring from within your nature. You're confident in that process. Right. And you expect it to happen, and it always happens. Mm -hmm. It's really good to be aware of when something springs into your mind, become you know more conscious of that, because that's very significant. That springing moment, it's kind of like the birth of something that knowledge that is your own. So it's a it's an important moment. Nor do we want the kind of knowledge that has been encased in rigid academic rules and stored away as valid for all time. Each of us claims the right to start from the facts we know, from our own direct experience, and from their advance to knowledge of the whole universe. We strive for certainty in knowledge 
but each in his own way. So it's talking about uh, book knowledge here. This reminds me when I'm preparing to do a video, I'll do a lot of research on the internet and I'll have about 20 windows opened up on my computer. I'll start making it my own in the sense of really condensing everything down into a few simple ideas and then I'll, I'll write like one sentence or something. So I really own that one sentence or two sentences out of about 20 computer windows of information. To make it my own, I boil it down into just a few uh, simple ideas than I really understand. When you're talking about speaking and how uh, it was reminding me of when Steiner was talking about uh, teachers. Uh, if the teacher stands up at the front and he reads whatever his lesson is, from his notes, it's because he doesn't know the stuff, and then the kid tells himself, why do I have to learn something that even the teacher himself doesn't know? Uh, you got to know what you're talking about. Each of us claims the right to start from the facts we know, facts of knowledge, facts of experience, and from there advance. Of course, this advancing from there is just going to be adding on more things of what we know and experience. You know, because we have to make it our own to be able to advance. We're not advancing by adding on book knowledge. We're adding on things that we know or book knowledge that we turn into our own. And then from there, advance the knowledge of the whole universe. And each of our paths will be different. So as we strive for certainty in knowledge, but each in his own way. But it has to be that way because we all have different life experience. We're all in different situations. We're all in different circumstances. We all think in our own way. We all have different amount of knowledge. Start looking at education and everybody's kind of given the same stuff, even though we're all unique, have different needs of knowledge. But that's a whole another topic. I am trying to find ways to develop better uh, control of my reactivity. What I'm studying right now are ways to take control over my reactions to my life circumstances and bring myself back into a, a center. And I'm using my reading of the philosophy of freedom to help me get more control over my reactivity. I just feel like just the practice of observing the train of thought that Rudolf Steiner gives us in the book is helping me to train my mind in a way that is more flexible and responsive instead of reactive. Well, you've been taking in all these ideas from different sources. What's been your process as far as how to make it your own? It's a basic kind of note-taking process ju just for the mechanics of, you know, reading the book paragraph by paragraph as a way to help me stay um, awake to what I'm reading. I use a um, computer program, which is it's really good at connecting I guess, the, I guess the technical word is maybe a relational database. You can connect different thoughts together. What I'd like to do more of is um, some form of teaching, you know, in some online way, videos, blogs, or, or what have you. Yeah, that, that's the next level I think I'll need to go to to really start to internalize the things I'm trying to learn. One of the best ways to be able to make knowledge your own is to have to share it with somebody else. A study group like this can be an important part of the study of the philosophy of freedom. If you challenge yourself to be able to share what you've learned with, within the group, I'll be coming out with another video. I'm comparing Rudolf Steiner's path in the philosophy of freedom with the occult path presented in anthroposophy. See, what I'm trying to do in these videos is I'm creating a new perspective. Everything out of anthroposophy is a perspective from anthroposophy, which makes a lot of assumptions about you. It means that you believe in a lot of occult things where other people aren't going to really believe that. So everything that comes out of the anthroposophy perspective, even about the philosophy of freedom, has that perspective. 
So what I'm doing is addressing these topics about Steiner and the philosophy of freedom from a philosophy of freedom perspective, which is to- really totally different perspective. It's one that doesn't necessarily accept all the things that, uh, that are accepted by a theosophist. You know, I mean, a, a theosophist has a whole pile of beliefs that everything they say is, you, they assume that you believe all, this, all these things. Now, the philosophy of freedom doesn't have that perspective. It's a totally different one of more of a normal person. So I'm presenting things from that perspective so that there's another perspective out there. I'd like to talk about philosophy of freedom every day, but I don't think my schedule is going to allow that. This is what I do for a living. Based, well, not for a living. <laughs> no, I don't do this for a living. 